Um, good morning, Rick. Please join us. Um, we're going to spend. We, I wanted to spend a little bit of time today to talk about funding for problem gambling <coughs> under the lottery. If you buy a lottery ticket or you visit the website, you'll either hear the dulcet, bone, uh, the dulcet tones of a previous lottery director saying to play responsibly. Um, the, and on every lottery ticket, there's a 1-800 number or a website that talks about problem gambling. Um, we have, the, and now that we've merged the lottery into the Department of Liquor and Lottery, uh, there have been some proposed changes, there have been some changes that have been done in how we handle problem gambling, at least the funding for the programs. Um, the reason um, Mr. Barnett called me earlier this year just to say that the, you know, that the money for the programming, which he'll explain, has been cut, and um, I'll just put my own personal take on this on the table as we start. We make, we, the state who sells lottery tickets, which is a poison to some people, we make over 20 plus million dollars a year as, as the net proceeds to the state that go to education um, from the lottery funds. Putting $150,000 aside for a problem gambling program to me is the morally right thing to do. And to see it cut creates some optic problems. Um, that's where I'm coming from. But Rick, you run the program. If you could just give us a history of, of if you could just let us know what the program is um, and uh, how it works for you, that would be great. Okay. So uh, my name is Dr. Rick Barnett. I am a psychologist doctor at Licensed Outlaw and Drug Counselor in private practice in Stowe, and I am the uh, chief executive officer and president of a nonprofit called Carter, the Center for Addiction Recognition, Treatment, Education, and Recovery. Uh, our organization, which consists of three of us at this point, uh, mainly has, uh, has been uh, active in addressing problem gambling across Vermont through the grant from the Vermont Lottery originally starting in 20 fiscal year 2016. And uh, we also address all major addictions, alcohol and drug addiction, food, sex, and nicotine, in addition to gambling and gaming. Uh, recently, we were awarded a contract with the Department of Health to manage the Impaired Driver Rehab Program in three counties, Addison, Franklin, and Lamoille County. I bring this up only because Carter is, is expanding in terms of uh, trying to help Vermonters in various ways around vices. I was driving through Waterbury Center this morning and I noticed that good stuff changed from good stuff <laughs> to land. vice land. <laughs> so you can think of Carter as being a, somewhat of a, a nonprofit trying to address many, many vices. Uh, I, when I called into the Senate, um, one of the Senate committees a few years ago when uh, DraftKings and FanDuel was uh, lo lobbying to legalize uh, fantasy sports. I called in and I said uh, what my organization was and Dick Mc Senator McCormick said, uh, I said, you know, food, sex, gambling, gaming, alcohol, drugs, nicotine, and he, he said, he looked around the room and he said, well, that just about covers all of us. <laughs> sort of funny. So anyway, addiction is obviously very common, and it's in it's in the public uh, public consciousness every day. Gambling is one of those odd uh, addictions in that it seems to be the most hidden. Uh, people often don't ask for help when it comes to gambling problems until it's far too late. Just to put it in context, gambling as an addiction uh, has five times the suicide rate as other addictions. Uh, it's usually way too late at that point, obviously. People don't typically ask for help because it's the only addiction that's predicated on hope. If you keep shooting heroin, you won't get more hopeful. You won't sort of get the sort of, one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna win if I keep shooting heroin. I keep drinking my, my head off, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win. But uh, when you gamble, it, it's based on this idea, it's predicated on hope. So if you keep playing, if you keep you know, engaging in this addictive behavior, you might actually win. And it's kind of true, you might actually win. Uh, unfortunately, it, rationally, it's not true. People don't win, and uh, lives are lost, and uh, much pain and, and uh, problems come from problem gambling. So uh, in 2016, uh, 17, 18, uh, the time that Carter 
has been the steward of the grant. Uh, it was at $150,000 level. Uh, that was a grant that came directly, as my understanding, right through Vermont Lottery funds, handled by the Vermont Lottery. Historically, I believe it was handled through the Department of Health somehow, and there's still some dotted line connection to the Department of Health. They review, I think, the, the language in the grant every year that it comes up, uh, but they're, they're pretty far removed at this point, although I had a discussion with the Department of Health about this recently. And what the grant does, is, and that's in, um, in this, uh, let's see here, the, what you have on the screen there and in your files is really the first uh, paragraph, the first sentence. Uh, what we do is we manage a phone and text hotline for people who run into problems. Uh, Representative Stevens mentioned the 800-522-4700 number that people can call. We maintain a counselor network for referrals and treatment, so if someone does call and they need help, we can get them into seeing a counselor as soon as, we, as, soon as possible. Uh, we don't pay for the treatment. Setting up a treatment program for problem gambling or any kind of addiction or mental health issues is, a, is quite an endeavor, and it costs quite a lot of money, far more than $150,000. Um, but we do refer people to treatment. And then what a, a lot of what we do is we provide education and public awareness in trying to help other counselors and the public raise awareness around problem gambling issues. So those are the three charges of the grant that's written in the terms of the grant. And uh, it, as lottery has merged with liquor, uh, at the 11th hour last, last uh, at the end of last session, uh, Carter was informed only by uh, trying to find out whether we could apply for the grant again, that the grant had been cut from 150 to 100 thousand uh, dollars, we were able to apply for the grant, and the grant was awarded, but we didn't get the first check uh, of 25 thousand dollars until October of 2018, and the grant cycle starts July 1st. So since the liquor and lottery have merged, it's no one has really seemed as though there's been a lot of oversight of uh, uh, who's, who's in charge of this, this grant. Uh, and uh, Carter has been interested in keeping things going to the extent that it's possible. Doing so at the $100,000 level is still possible, but we are hamstrung a little bit more because one of the things that we focused on so much was public education and continuing education or professional development around problem gambling. We went around the state in 2016, 2017 to many of the designated agencies, the VA in White River Junction, uh, veterans are severely impacted by gambling. Uh, we went around to private practitioner groups, different uh, so professional associations, and provided continuing education credits for free for these folks to learn more about problem gambling. Uh, we have not been able to do that as much this year. I've been focusing a little bit more on um, social media campaigns, podcasts, uh, some work with uh, other media, forms of media, St. Mike's uh, newspaper did, a, did an article about problem gambling on, on college campuses. Uh, and also, I would like to bring to the committee's attention that sports betting has been legalized uh, in the last year in many states, or is going to be legalized in many states, and Vermont is definitely taking a look at it. Uh, at this point, I don't know what the future of that holds, but just by way of saying that gambling is more and more woven into our culture, and that's going to be uh, present more and more people with problems around gambling. Uh, it, I don't think it's a good time to cut the funds for this kind of uh, public service. Uh, I, I call it an insurance policy. Some people call it a moral obligation. Uh, People do not call for help in large numbers. And if you just look at the numbers of people calling or getting help, that's a very difficult number to measure success by. It's really an effort to continue to raise awareness around these issues, to educate the public, to educate professionals, to screen for this, to address this when people do reach out for help. That's the most important thing, I believe. The hotline is very important. I don't mean to minimize that at all. But the u u utility of it, the um, the volume of calls is not, it's not high. People call often because they're looking for lottery numbers. Frankly, there's a, an important amount of uh, wrong numbers or people looking just what were the numbers last night or whatever. Um, because they just look on the back of the card and they say, well, I'll just call this number. And, and you know, problem gambling for mine, like, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> That's not what I was looking for. Although maybe they should have been looking for it. Uh, uh, so, but people do call. I mean, I've had, strangely enough, I've had more calls this last month 
than I've had in a long time, and people with real, real problems. People saying, you know, I called the hotline four or five years ago, I'm back in a jam again, I spent all my money on gambling, going to the casinos. This is not just lottery, by the way, this is all gambling. And I like to extend it to gaming. Video game addiction, there's all kinds of built-in money or fake money stuff into video games. People are calling for video game help, gaming, gambling, casinos, poker, lottery, bingo, uh, you name it. There's so much of it in our society. It's not just lottery tickets, although lottery tickets are some, some portion of what people call about. Uh, yeah, people are calling like, like serious issues. Someone calling for her sister who's 75 years old who spends all her money at bingo. Uh, someone called because her, their husband just mortgaged the house or, again and is going burning through that because of his gambling problem. Someone uh, playing uh, house poker games in Burlington who has just lost $3,000 on the last game uh, looking for help. So, I mean, these, are, th these, these don't happen in high numbers, but you know, two, three, four calls a month of people running into serious problems, and we try to get them help. So that's my background in loosely. The materials that I've provided for the committee is just to show you what a year-end report looks like. That was last year. Uh, and, uh, and then a quarterly report, which was the last one that we did uh, from October 1st to the end of 2018. The next quarter, third quarter is due this month, and we'll get that into the Liquor and Lottery uh, Board uh, by uh, April 15th. That's when this month's due. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, and uh, I think I've been clear on what I've been asked. What I'm asking for is to restore the, the funds to 150, if possible. There was also a $50,000 line item in the lottery budget for um, advertising about problem gambling. I don't know where that number, what what that, what happened to that $50,000. So it was really $200,000 that was set aside at one point for problem gambling services. So now there's 100 for the uh, for what Carter does, and then I don't know about the separate line item for for advertising. So. Questions. So how do people get to know about your organization? I mean, so you mentioned education, which of course I think is the basis of all things that need to be dealt with. But so how if I had if I didn't call Sorry, so. the number on the back of the lot and ticket and, and I have a problem in some sort of addiction, mm -hmm. how would I know that? I mean what in terms of education, how do you have to I hate to use the word advertise in the sense that we commercially use it, but how do people learn about you? I think that we started off with a bang in terms of reaching out to all the designated agencies. The designated agencies, the mental health agencies across the state. So if someone were to present in a designated agency for mental health or any other services they might be getting, and a counselor or case manager was aware that there was a gambling problem, they would think, oh, Carter, handles problem gambling in Vermont, let's call them and see if they can help us with this particular person. So that's one way to do it. Um, certainly having these uh, free CE events, raising awareness for professionals, uh, is one way to get the word out that Carter runs problem gambling in Vermont. Uh, we sponsored the Howard Center has a huge conference every year in Burlington. Last year was on opioid uh, use disorder and pain, and there was something like 350 people there, problem gambling in Vermont provided some funding for that, so we could have a table there, and I got to introduce a couple of the speakers, which was really cool, uh, and I've never spoken in front of that many people before, and so that was neat. But that also raises the, sort of the, 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 raises the public consciousness around that. One follow-up. So do you find, um, at least I think of people getting involved in gambling, tend to be adults in the, but do you find young people, younger, high school, college, well, do they seem to be developing problems? And well, of course, they have. It. There are all kinds of addiction. So I guess my I'm sort of answering my own question. But do you ever? Does your foundation ever participate in job fairs, which may sound odd, or college recruiting when they have recruiting days on different campuses? Mm -hmm. Um, the reason I ask this is because <laughs> frequently I see um, credit card companies mm -hmm. popping up at these kinds of things mm -hmm. because they're dealing with young people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is that? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. Now that, so that subgroup, that population has the highest <coughs> rates of problem gambling. 
for sure. Really? Uh, eight, nice. Yeah, because of uh, it's fast paced. A lot of the sports betting, fantasy sports, uh, video game, gaming, uh, it's very popular among young people. So if you look at problem gambling incidence rates, you'll see a higher incidence in the eight. You'll see that, like you said, a second ago. You'll see that for any addiction, marijuana, uh, alcohol, uh, stimulants. You know that sub that population, eighteen to twenty-five, is the highest, and gambling is no no exception. So is there any participation at this point of your your Just I mean I was del I was delighted to have that uh, that article come out for the um, the Defender I think of St Mike's College newspaper um, that would, they did a piece on it because they're obviously aware of it they sought out Carter saying hey we heard you guys were the problem gambling people can we interview you for problem gambling because we're having issues on campus here so it is something that's starting to that that we're obviously it's percolating so the word, it's percolating yeah the word's getting out that. So I, my suggestion would be, I was uh, a college admissions advisor. And so within the scope of the things that I did, I was involved in recruiting mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I would think that that is a really great, um, that would be a really great uh, event mm -hmm. um, for your group to be, have a table at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because there's apt to be people who will respond because they see you right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and also with the sports betting. And it's nominal in terms of cost mm -hmm. to participate, at least it was, this is many years ago, but there's certainly not a, a big heavy price tag um, for being able to participate. Yeah, I'd so. love to do that, yeah. and, cool. and it's a good way of networking with the mm -hmm. college admissions people who very frequently uh, become aware of problems that students have, mm -hmm. so be a good resource. Yeah. Representative Kalaki and then Walsh. Sorry. Um, I just, <clears throat> I'm just reading your report here, and I just want to make sure I have the numbers. In the, in the quarterly report, there were 24 calls that came in the last three months. Is that? Yes. Is, okay. And does that hold for each quarter? It's about 20, 25 calls? 20, 20 to 30. Uh, calls per month. I mean, per quarter. It just to me, it, uh, with the amount of constriction, if, if you have less money, it seems even more passive in a way. And if you could reinvent this program, would the hotline be the way to do it? I, don't, I really think the hotline needs to be there as an essential tool, but it's really it, it has so many <laughs> problems because. Um, well, for one, when people reach out for gambling, they may call a private practitioner or a community mental health agency directly. They're not going to come through the, the hotline. Yeah. They, or, they, or it may come up during the course of counseling with somebody. So it's hard to track that. 211 also has Problem Gambling Vermont or Carter listed as a uh, person. So if someone calls Vermont 211, they'll, they'll uh, and they ask about gambling problem, gambling services. Uh, 211 will get that information. I don't have access to 211's data. There, there's no communication there. So the hotline itself, I wouldn't get rid of it. Um, really, the, the question is like, how do we continue to raise awareness so that when people do run into problems, we're talking four to 6,000 Vermonters per year struggling with gambling addiction. It's not a small number, but the percentage of those people actually reaching out for help, it's, it's pretty hard to track. Um, so I'm not sure, I know every state uh, gambling council has a hotline to call. This 1-800 number actually is a national number and it tracks the 802 and then redirects it to Vermont when it's an 802 number. If someone's in Vermont and has a 978 area <laughs> code calling from their cell phone, um, they're going to get directed to another state. I don't know if 978 is Massachusetts, I think. Uh, and, then, and then they'll, they'll direct them back to Vermont. So it's not the best, but it needs to be there absolutely needs to be there as a resource. Okay, Representative Walls, then hang over the trail. Okay, I'm going to have a problem uh, formulating a question out of this. Uh, <clears throat> dealing with addiction it seems to me a really, really hard thing to do in uh, trying to any kind of addiction. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious, I noticed there's reference to Gamblers Anonymous in here. So it sounds as if you were, is that a referral process to Gamblers Anonymous? And I'm just wondering, do you have any kind of numbers on successful treatment? Uh, what, how can you measure success, I guess is my question. 
Well, first of all, you have to track the people getting into treatment, and then you have to track whether the treatment's helpful. Uh, treatment, like you said, it's a pitch. I mean, for, for addiction, it's really, really hard for uh, people to uh, get into stable recovery, long-term recovery. Uh, so the guy, like I said, that called recently, he said, you know, four or five years ago, I called the hotline, I talked to somebody who was really helpful, I got my stuff back on track, I was doing well for three or four years, and now here I am again in the same situation. So right. it's very difficult. There are, I mean, Gamblers Anonymous, any 12-step uh, approach, uh, public uh, community organization like that, mutual aid group is, is one very valuable resource in my opinion, but it's not formal treatment. Uh, formal treatment, again, if you look at the numbers of counselors, I've trained many counselors on gambling, uh, you know, two-hour intro to gambling addiction. And, you know, as counselors, we don't really think of asking about it, screening for it, and then what do you do when you find it? And how do you treat it? You know, at that point, a lot of, uh, a lot of professionals, you know, in, in, uh, in, our, in our education, our training, we don't get a whole lot in around, around uh, gambling. So. That's one thing that I really enjoy about uh, being able to be a minister of this grant is I get to sort of inform people, raise their level of skill when, when people do cross their cross their doors into their office. Tracking the, the, the success, it's tough. It's tough. Because it's a you know, people say it's a chronic relapsing disorder, you know, people whether it's gambling or food or sex or alcohol, drugs, nicotine, it's you know, people can cycle through quite a bit. Thank you. I answered my own question. <laughs> Perhaps I'm trying. So, um, in, in a typical individual who reaches out for gambling addiction, um, do you is there a pattern there? Is it someone who has just lost their <coughs> week's paycheck and is looking at how they're going to pay their rent and possibly not be able to? Are those the, is those typically the folks that are reaching out, or is it just somebody long term thinking, boy? I could have done a lot with the money that I lost over the years, and uh, and maybe I should consider this. Is no, there a pattern there, bad, Rick? Yeah, it's bad. Good to see you, Rick. By yeah, the way. Good to see you, Thank you. Uh, no, it's bad. It's bad when people call. Like someone uh, had somebody call from the Lamar County Mental Health a couple of years ago. I remember they called because they had just blown uh, ten thousand dollars and then two thousand dollars in like the next. 24 hours, and like they, they somehow cobbled together another 2,000, lost that right away. And they were ready to put, put a bullet in their head. So they were, they were evaluated by crisis services, uh -huh. determined it was a gambling problem. They contacted me, I, I met with a guy a few times to get him stable again, and, uh, and I, I don't know what happened, I think he's doing okay, but uh, So they, it's usually bad, I mean, so another woman, like I said, there was a woman that called a couple months ago about her sister, terribly worried about her sister because it was really looking dire, that she was blowing through all this money, uh, this is an older woman, and, and that's not an uncommon population. Older, older women with uh, bingo or slot machines in, in the casinos. That's a very, it's a uh, uh, important group, and um, and it's usually bad. It's bad when people call. Yeah. yeah. So that was my other question: is what, what type of gambling is it? So I mean, accessibility to. to um, Casino, casinos with a free bus ride down and a free lunch and a twenty dollars in, in chips uh, is pretty enticing for just for entertainment for senior citizens. You know, I mean, my father used to do it. Uh, fortunately, he wasn't <laughs> uh, didn't go ago. So is that is that a lot of it, or is it scratch off tickets? I mean, or is it everything? It's everything. I, yeah. I, was, I was saying that earlier. It was, it's. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's, no, it's fine. It's, it's everything. It's uh, a lot of times it's casinos that run people uh, run into yeah. problems. Yeah. We work. One thing that Carter does as part of our our uh, national, you know, cooperative effort is that we're part of the National Council on Problem Gambling. Yeah. We're part of the regional council. So Massachusetts just come online with all these casinos. Yeah. So that's going to affect Vermonters as well. Yeah. Uh, and so we're part of those those other can gambling councils. They they know me. Uh, we know them. We work together. I get all this information from them to sort of keep up to speed with everything. That's a huge part of it. So I go to conferences to keep up to, up to speed with everything that's happening. And it's, it's a lot, you know, it's house poker games in Vermont, it's lottery tickets, it's bingo, it's uh, video gaming, it's, uh, it's online slot machines, online gaming uh, opportunities, online poker. Uh, so there's a variety of ways yeah. that people can blow through their money. <laughs> I was curious. <laughs> Representative Kalaki, they lunch. So when someone calls you and they, they lost significant dollars, are you able to refer them to free services? Or like free counseling, or, or because they've lost their money. I mean, what, what's the next step for help? 
in, so, uh, right, in 2013, the, the, the Bible that psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health providers use called the DSM, the DSM-5, came out. And for the first time, a non-substance addiction was listed in there as a, as a billable code. Gambling disorder is a billable code. It used to be billed, It used to be under a different name in previous versions of it. But now insurance companies are really recognizing this as a reimbursable code. So if that person does have health insurance, they don't have to pay out of pocket for that. Some people, some people don't have health insurance, and they like. I there are there there is a little bit of extra money in there that we might be able to help people um, pay for a portion of a few sessions just to get them going. I, I want to get them access to care. I, a guy called recently, he's like, I don't have insurance, I don't have any money left. And he said himself, he's like, but if I'm spending all this money on gambling, I should be able to come up with some money to pay for counseling if I want help. So he was aware of that. But I was like, look, if it, if it helps at all, we can contribute a little bit to get you going. Um, but that's not part of the grant. Again, running a treatment program for mental health, for alcohol, drugs, gambling, it costs a lot of money to, to staff that and to, to run that. So we a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars we can have to do that. But we can assist people. Um, Representative Mosh, then I want to get um, Deputy Commissioner up as, as well. So Okay. Um, do you think now casinos and I'll focus in on that. Um, they're in the business to make money. That's what their business is. But have they, uh, so obviously they are aware that there's big gambling problems out there. Do they do anything in terms of big gambling to help neutralize that yeah, in some way? And, yes. and, 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 and so my comment is um, having not a whole lot of exposure to gambling houses, but in Canada, it used to be that if you went to the casino, you'd have to exchange money for, in order to do the one-on-one bandits. Um, and it strikes, and, and now it's totally, it's different, because you can do things by credit card. And you can do that on those little sunships and all that kind of stuff. Which, uh, it's like we have benchmarks to help people stop and reconsider what they're doing in other areas um, and I think that re changing the system the way they did, it's easier for people to just get at the moment carried away. It's very easy to take your card and put it in there and let it run up whatever, as opposed to having to physically go to a place within the casino, exchange money. Mm -hmm. That's a stopping point to me. You have to really think about it, because you're handling you now. Mm -hmm. And, and then having to refill, so to speak. So it, again, it's another. And that's all been removed. So to me, that's more, it, it, it's easier. It makes it easier for people to fall into that and really get entrapped in it. So it's a comment. So I don't know. Well, there, there are, so Massachusetts has something called Game Sense. And Game Sense has all these kiosks around the casinos that people start, if it registers for them that they have a problem, they can go to the Game Sense machine and they can register. Uh, they, there's also voluntary self exclusion uh, rules or guidelines so that people can exclude themselves from casinos. Uh, these other states, gaming commissions, uh, lotteries, they, they fund a tremendous amount of problem gambling efforts. And uh, you know, because Vermont doesn't have casinos, we don't have the kind of funds to be able to do that. But um, again, we still have Vermonters that go to the casinos, so it's it's prudent for Vermont to be aware of voluntary self-exclusion, game sense, all these different ways that people uh, could access help if they if they realize that they have a problem. One of the things that we testified on in, a couple of years ago on the uh, FanDuel and DraftKings fantasy sports legislation, and now as sports betting comes online, is to make sure that any online uh, program or company that provides gambling services has a clearly spelled out area where people can click and voluntarily, voluntarily self-exclude or, or there's ways to um, enter your information so they can track how much money you're spending and they can send a, a, a flash thing out saying like you've spent this much money you know you may have a problem you know, people can just ignore it, of course. But there are things built into that, and that, that's, those are important stop gaps for people who, who do take a moment to realize they might have a problem. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, you can add, wait, we're just, I'm just being a little bit attentive to everybody's time. 
um, and Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner of Justice Jones. Sure. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Deputy Commissioner Kessler. Um, you missed the opening of the. Um, I apologize. I misscheduled the. Uh, you the, what? I misscheduled the time. I apologize for that. Um, well, I'm glad you made it. Um, so we just heard. We all, I think you know what the issue is um, here. Um, from my personal perspective, speaking solely for myself, um, the optics of changing the grant when it's a multi-gazillion dollar operation of um, you know, that the optics of it aren't very good when we're trying to promote control. That's where I'm starting from on this conversation. Um, and just thought I'd start with sure. that and then hear from you. Um, I, one of the reasons I, I wanted to have this conversation in, in committees because there was so much telephone game going on between different aspects of this conversation. I just wanted to give us an opportunity to, to talk about it here. Sure. So uh, just as, a, as a, a start, I think the um, <coughs> amount of money the Commissioner Delaney and I were not responsible for the department uh, last budgeting cycle. Uh, only we, we came to be responsible in managing the department after the special session um, and took over in July. Um, so I think whatever the legislature decides is an appropriate amount of money would be fine with us. Um, if it's 100,000, 150, 200, 500,000, whatever you, whatever you decide, um, the money comes out of the proceeds that the lottery makes um, in profit. That's money that won't go to the education fund. Um, I would like to try um, a different approach than the approach that's been used in the past and have been uh, speaking to our board um, as well as to others around the country about how we could uh, do more with the money that we do spend, whether that's 100000 or 200 or whatever the sum is. Um, I'm not convinced that the present system that we're using is generating the result uh, that we would necessarily like. And as a steward of the state's money, uh, in the end, I, I just, I, in good conscience, I just don't know that this is the, the best way to continue uh, to move forward. Um, I did provide you with the annual report. Um, you could look and see how the money was expended uh, in the prior year, just to get a sense about about that. So I've spoken to uh, again to many other states at, at uh, lottery gatherings to find out what they do as far as problem gambling. It spans the range from nothing um, to uh, money that goes for grants to money that's uh, used in a number of different ways. I think going forward. Um, and and was, was mentioned, I appreciate the question that, that was asked about money that actually pays for treatment. Um, you know, if someone spent all their money on gambling um, and looked to lose their house because they don't have the money to pay the bills or get kicked out of their apartment or lose their car, lose their job, whatever it happens to be, um, it would be helpful if there was money that would actually help those people get treatment. Treatment can cost $50 or in instances $200 an hour. And, um, you know, it's important that people get the treatment. The existing grant of $100,000 really provides no money, effectively, as was already, already mentioned, uh, to actually pay for the treatment. So that's one direction we're looking at. I've reached out to 211. Um, they're willing to manage the, the phone hotline component um, of the calls. Um, and again, the, the, the rate to do that is, um, is, is relatively low. Uh, effectively we'd be picking back up to a system that already exists. Uh, so I think that you know that would be prudent. Just looking at trying to, to, to spread this out, um, one of the other options that we have now that we're a combined department is uh, through liquor education. Everyone who sells uh, alcoholic products, um, so that would be a bartender or uh, wait staff, but really more convenience store employees, all have to be trained in order to be able to sell that product. Now that we have a lottery as well, um, there are programs that we can integrate into the training for convenience store clerks to be recognizing the signs of problem gambling. That's an area that the state has never been engaged with, uh, and and I would like to you know put some resources into that, make that part of the standard training for uh, store clerks, so that you know they can try to help people as well. I mean that is the point of interaction. Uh, between the lottery and and, uh, and, the, and the participants. So again, you know, putting some resources into that is one direction. Putting aside a sum of money, what, whatever amount of money is 
um, budgeted for this um, to actually pay for treatment. So we would, you know, we would be looking to help uh, people that have problem uh, with gambling uh, be able to apply to us to get money to uh, pay for the treatment that they need, as opposed to now they just get a referral, um, and then they need to figure out how to, how to make that work. Um, that seems to me much more uh, effective and a better use of money um, than, than how it's been expended in the past. So again, we're just starting to explore different options that this grant runs uh, at the, till the end of the um, the end of the year, uh, the end of the fiscal year. So we are looking at other options for uh, uh, for expending those resources going forward. That I think will just be a better use of, of, of the money and will help people um, in a, in a meaningful way. Really, and not um, and not to say anything's wrong with the system we have now, but I think it would be appropriate to try some things different than what we're doing. I, I have uh, reached out to other organizations that would be willing to come in and provide the same kind of free training, um, free continuing education credits uh, around the state. I think that's very, you know, very useful to make sure we have enough providers um, around the state, use the money to help get um, you know, gambling uh, groups started around the state so people don't have long drives if they're interested in, in, in doing that. Again, I think just taking a different approach to, you know, to how this money is spent, whatever the sum happens to be. Um, I just want to be sure that we spend it as wisely as possible and get the most results for the money that we do spend. Well, um, I'm happy to hear that we're finally approaching a level of training people who sell the tickets. Um, that has been a bugaboo of mine for 10 years now. Of, of saying if you can cut someone off for drinking, if you can recognize that you can, that someone's drank, has had too much to drink, um, why can't we apply that to something that's a little bit more quiet and insidious and invisible, which is which is a gambling addiction. Um, so I applaud the department's desire to move in that direction. Um, what do we mean by generating you know, different outcomes. Is that part of the having money for p potentially having money for grants for people to get into it, or is it, or is it? A, I mean, how do you measure the success? Uh, how how should one measure a success? A suicide hotline, for instance, is how do you measure su the success of a suicide hotline? This is this is slightly less Im slightly less tense. But I think what we heard the testimony on is that when someone has a problem that this, that's this deep and they're that desperate to call, it really helps to have a, someone at the end of that line. Well, we, we would have, I mean, the same, the same uh, type of service. In other words, it's a referral service that's going on now. We would have the referral service. But they'd also be told that, look, if you, if you can't pay for treatment, which is what we want the people to get in the end is treatment. Um, there's no money in this being expended now, or, or as again we heard, a very small amount maybe um, to help people get treatment. Making a referral to a provider that you can't afford to pay for doesn't get you any treatment whatsoever. So being sure that these people have the opportunity to get treatment at no cost um, or very low cost, I think is a way, is a better use of the money than, than where we are now. Um, and, and, and as far as, I mean, there are some differences. I, I do think that it is the right step to train our, uh, uh, the staff, the, the people that sell the lottery tickets. Um, there are some differences between, obviously, in, you know, in, in signs of impairment that can be observed and someone who's spending too much of their money on, on lottery tickets. So if I come to store A uh, and, and spend uh, $100 on scratch tickets, and you think I have a problem, I just go across the street or the next block up and the store up the street isn't going to be able to detect that I'm impaired uh, by gambling too much, um, they won't know that. And, and so, uh, again, I, I think having uh, educated salespeople would, you know, would be helpful, um, but it, it's not exactly the same as on, you know, on the liquor side. So that's, um, that's part of it. But I, I think, again, the goal is to get to good outcomes. I, I have to say that in, in looking this over and then doing a little bit of research about how this, this was funded in the past, I think the department essentially took the easy way out. Um, it's just easy to hand someone some money and say it's your responsibility now. And um, the department doesn't have to do anything um, from there on out. I think that our goal is to take more responsibility for what goes on with how this money is expended and try to have some um, more measurable outcomes. 
again, if, if, you, if you look at the number, I mean, it's, it's so hard to know what the outcomes were. What you can measure is the number of calls, and it's a very, very small number. Um, and, and so how do, we, you know, how do we do better on that front? What else can we do um, from an advertising perspective? Again, the lottery ads do talk about playing responsibly. Uh, the, the back of the tickets include the phone number. Uh, but are there other things that, that you know, we can do to try to get people more aware of, of the options that are out there? But I think letting people know that there, there is an option that includes treatment that could be funded in a way that doesn't require them to, um, who, who, if they have no money, uh, to be able to get that treatment, I think is a, is a giant step in the right direction. So I think a number of these things, these are all forward steps that and the department would, would own uh, moving them forward again as opposed to in the past. The department gave the money to the health department, uh, and then they found the provider. Um, it, it's just I, I, I just think that was just a way just not to have to be responsible for it, but we did something with problem gambling. We funded it, and that's the beginning and end of it. I think we need to be more engaged and make sure that we're getting to the outcomes that everybody wants us to get to. Yes, John. But does that mean you're going to come in with a proposal? that the best practices for Vermont would be to spend $500,000 or whatever the number is, rather than saying, well, if you only give us 100, we'll do the, we'll do the best we can. I, I'm unclear what you're saying. So I, I don't have a number in mind at this point. Um, again, I'm, we'll work with the number that we have in the budget, which is $100,000. Why, why that versus what you think was needed? Well, because I don't know what's needed now. I don't, I don't know that we, we, we can know. Um, exactly at this point what's what's needed. I think the hundred thousand dollars is a is a, a place to start. Um, I could come back in a year and tell you that we, we need more money than what was spent this last year, but I don't know at this point and um, if if the legislature decides to provide more money, um, you know, we'll look at whether there's prudent ways to spend that. In the end I think that's the most important thing um, as well is that we want to be good stewards of the money and make sure it gets spent in a way that results in the best possible outcomes. Um, certainly, I think the, the chair's question is, is very relevant. How do we measure those outcomes? And um, it, you know, I think engaging and getting people into treatment um, and making sure they at least take advantage of the treatment opportunities is, is one way to do that. There's all kinds of obviously reporting issues around that, but if we are providing money to providers, that would be one way to know that people got treatment. There'd be some proof that they actually went into sessions, got treatment, um, and hopefully made progress. I, I don't know if we can measure whether they relapse or not, we, we won't know that, but um, at least we know people will get in treatment, which now we, we really don't know. They know we get a referral, um, but we don't know beyond that. But to me, I think it's, it's, I think the legislature needs to hear from you what is needed versus saying, well, whatever the money legislature gives us, because it's been a very passive model, I'm hearing you say. So $100,000, well, well, I don't think it's, what, we need to hear from the experts about what is needed to, and not just you know, whatever you give us. Right. Well, well. Again, um, I, I don't. I don't have a number for you at present. I, I have some cost estimates for some right. uh, some areas, but uh, not for all. For the so, programs, yeah. what right. kind of programs you want? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Representative Marsh. <laughs> uh, picking up on John's comment, best practices. We have best practices for a lot of different areas that funding goes to. I'm, ex I'm suspecting that there is no such thing when it comes to not only lottery, but gambling in general. But I don't know. Right now, I don't know what the, I, again, I'll, I'll, the information I've been, able to, I've been able to gather is from speaking to others in the industry uh, to find out what, what's done in other states um, and, and try to build off that. But I don't, I don't have a number because I, I think we need to do more. Right, I, I'm not focusing it on the, on, the, on the amount, but, but rather the, the methods. And, and well, the methods have been this, essentially the same um, for a very long period of time. I think it, it would be helpful to try something different, see if we can't get some more uh, measurable oh, results. I, I'm often thinking outside of the box. I'm a great believer in that, you know, and sometimes it is trial and error. But, um, so I guess my question or my request would be if some kind of a loose best practices uh, submittal for consideration 
as you gather your information, if you do fact finding and that sort of thing, thinking out of the box, coming up with some suggestions, um, even at this point just for conversational exploring um, so that this problem can be dealt with. I mean, another component of this, I think, is just as we tackle cigarette smoking um, with early education programs in schools, I, yeah, I think that the same thing would be able to, or should be able to be done um, within the school framework. Um, and I recognize that just as children came from, many children were in home situations where there was a lot of smoking happening, still we made big inroads in, in over, over a period of time. So my sense tells me the same, a similar process. Uh, should be able to be somewhat successful in terms of gambling because the adults are doing the gambling and kids are being brought up in that environment. Um, and I don't, you know, uh, beyond observing that, I have no educational uh, input. Sure. Well, I, I would say, uh, I would say uh, Senate appropriations a few days ago, and they were asking about this as well. We had a conversation about it, and I am going to draft up uh, some of these different ideas about how we might move forward and, and uh, provide that in some kind of memo in the next few weeks. So I, I, I won't have cost estimates in there, but that would be the plan to look at a, a wide range of possible ways that we could expend the money to provide a better outcomes. I'm going to have to end this right now. This is something I do want to return to. I do have questions about um, Regardless of, of how or why a previous regime may have, may have chosen to deal with this issue, I have questions that I'd like to talk through you know, about, well, is it the role of the people who sell the tickets to develop programs to uh, deal with the potential addictions that come from those products, or is it to put an RFP out and ask the experts who deal with gambling addiction to put forward an RFP that develops a program, you know, in, in I, I'm just, you know, there's no answer for that this morning, but I just think, um, you know, the, the, the question, you know, there's just, I appreciate looking at every program that we have and seeing if it's the right program. I'm just, you know, I would just be concerned with, um, as I mentioned earlier, the optics of saying that if we're, if we um, are dropping a, a, a by, by 33%, if we're dropping our commitment to dealing with a problem, gambling problem, before we're developing a program, otherwise the optics of that just to me are not a, a positive uh, thing for, for the way that we're making the money on, the, on this. And, and I, just to be clear, the department didn't ask for any reduction in the, in the spending on this. So that's something the legislature decided to do. Um, and I don't know what the, what the rationale was for because I wasn't involved with the department at the time. Um, so I, Fair enough. Yeah, you guys would know better than, than I would about why that was um, why that was reduced or your colleagues would um, yep. at, the, at the very. That's, I mean, we just haven't had this conversation for a little while. So I pre and I do appreciate the fact that you took over, you know, late last year or mid time last year. And so that this is all part of your many faceted role yes. down at the department. So, yes. um, but it is important for us to get a handle on it. But thank you for coming in on this issue. And, and happy to come in if you have more time and you want to talk more about it. Again, we're going to continue to focus on this. Um, you know, the focus has come more, uh, more, we've been talking about it for a while, but more recently as a result of the conversation both here and in, in uh, Senate appropriations where they just are trying to figure out how much money they are interested in putting into this, we didn't have a number for them, um, but they were looking at the same number as what was provided in last year's budget, so mm -hmm. that's that's where it got started. Great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ron, what do we have for um, amendments coming up? We have two that we know of. Yep. And are they scheduled? 1045 and all of Just right Okay. So um, folks who are here for minimum wage. Um, Welcome. We have two amendments to the paid uh, to the family medical leave insurance bill that we have to hear at 10:45 and 11. 
So we can get testimony underway with the folks who are on the schedule right now. I do not want to make people feel like they're going to be speaking at two and a half times the normal speed um, in order to hear everybody this morning. But if people can um, allow us to take a break for half an hour and then come back at 11.15 for those that, that don't match or I don't think we're going to be here for... I certainly don't hope we're here for an hour talking about these amendments, but um, or just be aware that we may have to reschedule. So, but, uh, but for people who have traveled to come in, I'd like to prioritize them this morning. People who are either closely, more close to Montpelier, or uh, um, are in the building, I'd like to, yes, you know, if if we need to. Um, so, I'm going to look at this list, and I'm going to guess that Mr. Stritzler, you probably have driven the furthest today, or. Nori, is that did I? That, that's me, and um, I actually do have some flexibility today. If if you need to delay my testimony until after you address the amendments, I can wait. Okay, and there's no guarantee. Again, today you know, family leaves going on the floor today, so that is just <coughs> obviously at least mentally is is what's on tap. But um, let's just see how we go. Um, Let's just see how we go. Mr. Strisola, would you like to join us? Thank you. And we'll start with um, introductions. Uh, I'm Tom Stevens. I'm the state representative from Waterbury. I represent Waterbury, Bolton, Hutchinson, and Mules Board. Thank you. Matt. Hi, how you doing? Uh, Matt Byron, for Jens, Harrisburg, Penton, Addison. Thank you. I'm Zach from Barnard. Lisa Hango from Berkshire, and I represent um, Richburg, Berkshire, Franklin, and Hellgate. Marianne Kamosh, I'm from Swampton, and I represent Sheldon as well. John Kalaki from South Burlington. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Tommy Wolfs from Berry City. Thank you. Chip Troiano from Standard, representing Hardwick, Standard, and Walden. And I'm uh, Bill Stripsler uh, from Smuggler's Doctor Resort. But I'm here today representing the Vermont Ski Area Association. I'm a member of the board and an officer of the association. Although, uh, what I would like to discuss with you, uh, I believe, goes beyond the, the association's uh, interests. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that businesses, every business person I know, and I've had an opportunity to meet a number over time, through my association with the Business Roundtable and a number of other Vermont-wide uh, organizations that I've been part of. But every business person I know wants to pay more, not less. And there are many good business reasons for that, including uh, the, the loyalty you get from the employees and keeping the employees on staff uh, for prolonged periods of time it always improves their performance. So we do want to pay more, and the question is, what's affordable? For this particular legislation, there are two issues that I would like to discuss with you today. The first uh, that I'm not going to spend much time on is the payment for what we call our seasonal employees. When Smith, the owner of Trigger Resort, is going to submit a letter to you on that subject, so I won't dwell on it. The second, though, relates to the proposed 7% increase annually in the minimum wage. I had the great uh, experience of completing four years at Middlebury. And while there is a math major and an economics major, and my professor of economics, Professor Wolf, said, if you're going to talk about economics, always only speak from facts. So this morning, I bring some facts to you. They do relate to smuggler statistics, because those are the ones that I'm familiar with but I think that they're representative of the, uh, the rest of the industry at different scale. Um, our part-time payroll at Smuggers is $4 million, but the average pay of the part-time employees is $11.89, so it's well above today's minimum. The women are at $11.60, and the men are at $12.06. And and we have 400 seasonal and part-time employees third of them are seasonal. And it's the seasonal people who are at the minimum wage. The kind of jobs that they perform are lift operations, camp counselors, beginner ski instructors, summer lifeguards. 
many, frankly, a teenager particularly, with parents who are happy to have them out of the house during the summer. So they insist that they come to work with smugglers and get camp counselors so they won't be hanging around the, the house in the summer. Um, you've probably heard about the concept of wage compression. I won't dwell on it, but it does mean that you get if you give raises at the low end of the scale, those raises have to percolate up. But that may be the purpose of the minimum wage increases. But it's not simply increases for the low end. The wages have to per percolate up just for wage fairness, so that the people who are well experienced and have complex jobs do get paid fairly more than those who are inexperienced with straightforward jobs. So when we talk about the wage increases, it's not just at the low end that businesses would be concerned with them. Now, our full-time staff average is almost $18 an hour. It's actually 1797 um, And that, that is actually the full-time average for men. The full-time average for women is $19 an hour at Smugglers. And I can assure you that our women earn every penny of that extra. Um, is there a difference in their roles between genders? We, our management ranks are dominated by women. Um, Madeline Kuhn was asked me why that, you know, what did we do to make that happen? The answer was pretty straightforward. We didn't do anything special. The women earned their way into those jobs. We earned their higher paying jobs. Now, in the numbers that I just gave you, we do not include the top 10 salaries, so we don't get bias in the averages for the company. So now shifting to the specific issue of the 7% annual proposed wage increase. Uh, the Federal Reserve has said that they expect inflation over the next five years to run between 2 and 3 percent. Uh, that means, that in our business, that, that would mean about a $360,000 a year increase in our payroll. But under the proposed legislation, the increase would grow to $1.3 million. Now, it wouldn't be fair to me to tell you that everybody would get a 7 percent increase. That's not the fact. But if they were, that would be $1.3 million, or a million dollars less to invest frankly, we invest in the Vermont economy. Most businesses today that generate extra cash and then end up reinvesting in the business. It's also by observation you could find that most businesses can manage around reasonable mandates. You, know, you kind of find a way to do it if the mandates are reasonable. <clears throat> but that's only true in good times. What I want to focus on now the implication of the proposed legislation when times are not good, when there is a recession. Our greatest concern is managing in bad times. I understand that even the legislature is planning for an upcoming recession. Um, many are predicting it. When I worked at AT&T, we used to laugh at the, the uh, chief of the financial officer because he always predicted 12 of the last two recessions to make sure we were really sensitive <laughs> to what we had. <laughs> but in this case, it looks like recessions are almost for sure will arrive sometime in the next five years. <clears throat> when the recession arrives, everyone around this table realizes that you also have a reduction in business volumes. So businesses of large and small are faced with reductions in business volumes and the mandate of 7% a year increase in payroll. All right. I don't know of an economist, liberal or conservative, that would say that it makes good policy to raise wages 7% during a recession when business volumes are down. It just won't work. And what will happen is that businesses will react in ways that are not helpful to the overall objective. Most likely, what businesses will do is cut back on hours. Now, if you talk to our employees, they'll tell you they don't really pay that much attention to their wage level, their hourly wage level. What they care about is the paycheck that they take home at the end of the week. 
how much do I really end up with? And the way uh, they, during recession every time, the way a big mandated pay increase will be treated, I'm sure businesses are going to cut back on hours. It's a very distasteful way for us to operate because when you cut back on hours, there are always consequences, particularly in, uh, in customer service, which we all live on. So it's not, it's definitely not a preferred, but maybe just out of the straight economics, a required step for businesses to take. And unfortunately, that will affect those people who we most are trying to help. It's the low end of the, the wage scale. <coughs> So what do we do? Um, it's always a hard question, and it's a hard question for all of you. How do you balance the need to increase wages reasonably so that it can be sustainable? And the, I guess it's okay for me to use this word, the politics of what we're looking at. Um, now, the Senate has proposed at the end of achieving the $15 an hour, that we switch to an inflation measure. Um, history would say that at the end of achieving $15 an hour, the, the uh, nationwide desire to go beyond 15 will be <coughs> present by years from now. So the question again will become, what do we do? So I have a suggestion. And the suggestion is that Rather than a fixed 7%, we use an inflation multiplier. Not inflation itself, but a multiplier. So I worked around the numbers, and I came to two times the inflation rate could work, given the Fed's forecast. But perhaps on the minimum end, with a minimum of 2%. Of, uh, now, during the recession, we ran one year we ran with a minus uh, inflationary rate. I think that was 2009, 2015, I think it was under 1%. So two times really, in those cases, don't work. So I would say there'd have to be a minimum of 2%. And the limit of five and a half. So in difficult times, I think we could manage to those numbers that is to say that whatever the inflation rate is, we could double it, and that would become the new uh, amount to be raised in the minimum wage. Now, if you run the numbers at an inflation rate of 2.4% over the next five years, we would achieve $15 by 2026. Uh, during good times, 2000. 2008, using that as the, the guideline, you would get there by 2025. On the other hand, if we had a recession that ran the length of the last recession, then we would get there closer to 2007. I can, with, uh, with your permission, I would say that the headline would read, Vermont passes legislation guaranteeing wage earners increase at twice the inflation rate annually while avoiding the unintentional consequences of the recession on the very employers we're trying to help. I think that this suggestion would take a step in the right direction of getting us there. I guess the bottom line with you is I think it's absolutely important, very important almost mandatory, that we take into consideration what the impact will be on this proposed legislation in the event that there is a recession. Lightly, I'm asking this question. Um, in your experience, I mean, we've heard about the impending recession, and I think since it's been 10 years since the end of the last one. Um, 
and we've been we've been legislating in a lot of ways with this fear in the future. It's always there, whether it's two years ahead, five years ahead. Um, when we're comparing and contrasting the fear of, of a potential recession with how do we how do we find the good times? How do we define? Do we define the good times when we're in them or in retrospect, looking backwards? And did we take advantage of those good times? You know, and then we're trying now. We're trying to catch up. I, you know, I just. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I appreciate your your view on, on on the inflation part of it. I just, I'm like, I'm struck by we we always want to act in good times, and no economist out there like sends us a memo and says, "Hey, good times ahead." Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought movies. Maybe abuse isn't the right word. But always abuse with having a struggle when you're surpluses. And whether the surpluses should be saved for future, uh, future times and return to the taxpayer, those are, I think, really hard questions to answer. Um, some economists will say that the, the trend is okay now. Uh, it's almost, if you follow it closely, it's almost week to week. I think yesterday it looked like uh, the market was strong and we don't have anything to worry about. And two weeks ago, we were facing disaster. So it's a hard call to make, which makes it all the more important, I think, to have a plan that can go into action when the numbers show it, but does not have to be in action otherwise. And that's what I'm proposing, that as long as things are going along and something measurable, I know we all like to measure things, inflation rate is published and measurable, and usable. I'm suggesting two times that, uh, unless the number falls below 2%, but not an automatic 7% a year. Just to repeat myself, during recessionary times, business volumes down. There's not an economist that would tell you you should be raising rates 7%, seven times the uh, inflation. And from a business, I mean, you have a big, you have a, a big business, basically. I mean, four million dollars a year just for, just for income is pretty sizable. Um, we took testimony from from one of our economists that said, fifteen dollars in twenty twenty four, which is what the Senate proposal is, has the buying power of thirteen. 40 something today, say 1345 today. As you look out, how do you use that? I mean, the inflation, how do you, how do you, how do you look out and say, well, $15 today is really 1345 in five years. How does that work for you when you're, when you're planning your business, when you're, you know, when you're planning anything from how big my staff should be, how big, um, never mind what the, uh, never mind what the employer, the, the employee's needs are, but how does a business, owner project out like that for five years, expecting there to be some kind of recession ahead? Well, I'm somewhat embarrassed to tell you that I, we do not, and I don't know of any businesses that have any confidence in a four-year or five-year plan. That the one thing we know about our plan for next year, you know, there's only one thing we're sure of, and that is it's wrong. That it's either too too uh, aggressive or too passive. And looking out in today's world four or five years, we frankly don't try. What we try to do instead is to have our business operate in a way that we can quickly respond to whatever the circumstances are now. And we can figure out ways to respond to you know, a three or four percent increase. But we know in our plans, we cannot figure out a way to respond to a 70% increase, particularly during a recession. So what do we do? We bury our heads in the sand and we say, oh, that can't possibly happen. Um, but we all survive. You know, businesses are survivors. And unfortunately, as I said earlier, the survival tactic will be not good for the employees. Um, the, 
proposal you, you know, the conundrum that your, your proposal presents, right, is this, um, it sounds very measured and very reasonable. I mean, you're a very effective witness, I have to say. Um, but you're speaking from your own business's perspective, right? So like, if the legislature took up your proposal and said we're gonna peg it to this two and a half, or this 2% minimum threshold for raises, in recessions at large, businesses throughout the economy, irrespective of a mandated 7% increase, still lay off workers and still reduce their hours, irrespective of whether they have 7% built-in raises or not, right? In other words, so we could we could sort of take up this bargain with you, right? And say, we'll do this in order to prevent that, but the reality is that we have no actual assurance that it will prevent that, right? Because it happens. Yeah, I wish I could guarantee. Right. But what I can <laughs> say is that if we don't protect against it, that businesses will absolutely take action. Uh, we don't, but today, no, we have the opportunity to reduce hours today, but we don't because we can manage the inflationary increase. And uh, my compatriots and other businesses speak the same way. Because it falls into that category I mentioned earlier, we prefer to pay people well. It's much to our advantage. It's the business advantage to pay the people who work for them and pay them well. As to whether or not you would take actions without without this increase, I can't predict what every other business will do. I will tell you that we will not. We will not involuntarily reduce staff in favor of uh, overcoming a two or three or four percent increase in uh, minimum wage because our uh, our interest is in making sure that our guests are taken care of correctly. During the last recession, we, and I have a few others in our industry that I know that I've spoken to, we didn't have layoffs. We did have furloughs, but, we, but everyone came back to work uh, after the recessionary period. So we, we value our employees, and we were anxious to do the right thing for them. It's, it's self-interest. So I don't think you would find the arbitrary reductions in staff. I think that answers your question in an <coughs> obtuse way. No it, no, it answers it in a very specific way, which is specific to your business. But the concern is we've got to look at all businesses and what their, what their practices are, not just, not just well, the assurances we get from you. Well, answer it this way. If you look at, you, you would have to look at today's behavior. What the business is doing today under the today's circumstances. I don't hear about a lot of layoffs today. In fact, in your mind, I would say it's the opposite. We're all looking for more people, not fewer people. And if you go to any one of our business meetings, you'll find at the top of our list of not having enough qualified people to do the work. So we're certainly not seeing businesses today laying people off, and that's because times are pretty good. But when that turns around, I think is when you would definitely see the, that attitude change as well. And I, I can confidently say that's across the board. In your communities, your general stores, you know, your, uh, your parlors, beauty parlors, or men's parlors, or wherever you go, you see signs in the window, look, people looking for work. So we're not looking to lay people up. And you don't in good times. It's only when times really get to be rough that you have to do that. Any further questions for Mr. Strickland? Well, I just uh, looked up the average uh, inflation rate over the last 20 years, and well, like the computer told me, so I don't know, <laughs> but it's 3.2 percent. So <coughs> it, it, you're doubling on it over the last 20 years, close to so, so, you know, We're at a pretty kind of flat economy right now, it seems, with this 2% inflation. Um, yeah, it could, what you're saying is that if the next five years we duplicate the last 20, then this firm will really work. Yeah. But yes. I don't know about those moments, you know, those individual moments. Yeah. Representative Mosh. I find your testimony very interesting and would like, if, if you could make your 
written testimony available to our committee. What you have given us uh, contains a lot of information. Okay. And um, it would be helpful if you could do that. I'll be happy to do that. Um, will Monday be soon enough? Sure. No, we, we can get you connected with uh, with Ron, our committee assistant. Okay. He'll post it for us. All right. Thank you so much for your time and and thank you for being so receptive. I know it's a brand new way of looking at things, but today is my birthday, so I figured. Ah, all right. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Speaking of looking at your crystal ball, how much snow are you going to get next year? <laughs> you know, we, uh, every governor that I've known over the last 30 years always asks us, well, what can I do for you? And we always respond, bring us snow. <laughs> and they say, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs> um, Lenore? And I'm not butchering your name? Only very minimally, and it's uh, perfectly normal. Is it Anor? Anor, yes. Anor, okay. Well, my apologies for the butchery. And no apologies that. necessary. Um, so, uh, and again, we're, we may truncate you, um, or we will truncate you. Um, but please introduce yourself. You have a new role. Yes. Um, with an organization that we've seen here in, in this committee before on this issue. And yes. so, um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Anor Horton, and I'm the Executive Director of Hunger Free Vermont. And I have submitted uh, my full written testimony to right the right. committee. And so I will not <coughs> cover all of that in the interest of facilitating, you know, everyone having the opportunity to testify and, and questions. So um, Hunger Free Vermont is Vermont's statewide anti-hunger advocacy organization. We've been around for 25 years. Our mission is to end the injustice of hunger and malnutrition for all Vermonters. And a lot of what we do is work to um, make sure that we Vermonters are able to maximize their use of the federal nutrition programs that they're eligible for. So three squares of Vermont, school breakfast, school lunch, childcare meals, after school meals for kids, summer meals for kids, WIC, um, all that whole range of programs um, help to um, ensure that families and individuals who are not making enough money um, to cover all of their expenses, which I don't have to tell this committee that we have a significant number of Vermonters in that situation, um, or people who are unable to work for one um, reason or another, uh, have access to food and have access to enough nutritious food to ensure that they can work, uh, can maintain their health, can learn, all of those things that really are critical to avoiding human suffering, having a workforce that can work, all of those things. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we do. But fundamentally, we are out not to mitigate hunger, but to end it, and not just to end it any which way, but to end it in a just way, where people experience um, dignity in the way that they're able to access food. And we're certainly very far from that goal um, today. Um, many people, a lot of the rules that go along with the federal nutrition programs do not enhance human dignity uh, or the experience of dignity when they're used. Um, that's, it's better than going to a food shelf or food pantry and relying on charitable food, but it's not, it's not the ideal vision. Um, and that is why Hunger Free Vermont has chosen to join the coalition working to raise the minimum wage in Vermont, and that's why I'm here today, um, to speak to um, the issue of human dignity and the importance of 
making sure that people have a, a wage that will allow them to take care of their basic needs. Um, and also to say that because of the way the federal nutrition programs are structured, uh, we have a pretty significant number of people in our state who do not qualify for free school meals for their kids or Three Squares Vermont, or they qualify for Three Squares Vermont at such a low benefit level that it's not worth it for them to go through everything they have to go through to apply. And yet they can't um, meet their nutrition needs. Um, a recent research study from the Urban Institute that looked at how we might end child hunger in Vermont noted that um, as many as 42% of the children in Vermont, one in seven, uh, who are living in food insecure households right now, may be living in households that earn too much money to qualify them for free school meals or three squares Vermont. So however much we, we work to expand the access to those programs for people who qualify, the structural way the federal programs and the federal poverty line are set means that people who need food assistance can't get it. So just stop there for a second. Please. So the federal, so SNAP is, is that the current name for it? That's the federal name for it. Right. We call it Three Squares Vermont, right. but yes. But so so Three Squares is set at, a, what, is the, what is the numerical number? What is the salary cap for receiving um, the benefit? Right. So for a family of four, it's 185% of the poverty line, which is about 44,000 something dollars a year. And, and at that level, if I make $43,000 a year, yeah. how, how, many how much in benefits would I roughly receive? Well, that really depends on a whole bunch of factors, but you might receive as little as $16 a month, or you might receive $50 a month. You know, for a family of four. Depending on how many other deductions in a very complicated application you qualify for. Does it match in some way or correlate in some way to the same way that um, child care subsidies are for people at that at that wage as well? Whereas if you were at 100% of, of the poverty level with a family of four, you receive 100% of the child care subsidies that we provide but at 200% or at 300%, whatever, but at 200%, you receive 10%. I mean, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, it is something like that, yes. And school meals are pegged to the exact same 185% of the poverty line. So, um, and, and other programs are also. So if you don't qualify for Three Spurs Vermont, you also likely don't qualify for access to school meals for your kids and, so and you, you one know last, and one yeah. last one last little factoid with this yeah while we see our incomes rising anyway at the lowest levels the federal poverty level doesn't change <clears throat> so this is part of the benefits cliff anyway that exists because because whatever that number is at 21,000 or 44,000 <coughs> doesn't change correct Okay, I just want to be clear that that's, this is like, this is the nub of the problem, is that these, these constrictions that you have are not changing while the rest of the world is. Correct. Okay. Absolutely correct. Right. So, right, and so we have families living in the benefits cliff already. Raising the minimum wage will have more families in that benefits cliff. So we're not pretending that that's not the case, and, and, and this will have to be monitored very carefully, you know, and we will need to think about creative ways to help address that. One, one campaign of Hunger Free Vermont is to make uh, Vermont the first state in the country to make school meals universal. In other words, to provide school meals as part of education to every student, um, because that would help to mitigate a part, not all, of the benefits cliff. But nevertheless, I'm here advocating for increasing the minimum wage because fundamentally we have got to, um, you know, we have got to help people to be able to achieve um, their basic needs 
um, in a way that they experience as dignified. Um, so I wanted to speak to something that both of you just brought up. There are schools, particularly in rural Franklin County, that all students are receiving free meals across the board. It doesn't matter whether they particularly qualify or not. So I did want to bring that up, that that is already happening in certain areas. Yes, so we've been working with schools since 2014 to make that happen. And 24% of the public schools in Vermont currently provide universal school meals. And um, we've done some studies with the University of Vermont that show some pretty remarkable benefits um, for health, for family economic security, for um, social climate and bullying for readiness to learn. So I, we think that there's a lot of wins to be had, but, but in particular, we need to be thinking in creative, outside of the box ways if we're going to raise the minimum wage because we're going to cause more families to not be eligible for some of these critical nutrition supports. And again, it's a reason for us to think creatively and play outside the box, um, not to not raise the minimum wage. Representative, uh, actually, uh, Representative Tango, you can follow up and then Representative Kalai. Thank you. So I'm assuming that you've thought very carefully about this because of the cliff and because of potentially causing those families who now qualify for universal school meals, for instance, to not qualify anymore and, and the ramifications of raising the minimum wage and you feel your organization feels that it is more beneficial to raise the minimum wage and see these families potentially losing or these communities actually because the whole community is depending on a number of families qualifying. Mm -hmm. So the whole community could therefore lose meals but still be better off with a higher minimum wage. Um, Yes, yeah, so we have agonized over this, and you've put it very well. And it is true that one way that schools qualify under current federal rules to provide universal meals depends upon the percentage of students whose households are already receiving, mostly in Vermont, it's three squares Vermont. And so yes, if the number of kids in those households declines, then, that, then the school could lose its eligibility under one provision. But there's another provision that schools can also use to provide universal school meals. It is more complicated, it is not quite as financially beneficial, but we, there, is, there are ways that we can preserve and even expand universal school meals in Vermont so that those communities do not lose that program. But we would have to do something. The legislature would have to do something, communities would have to do something. So, so that's not already in place, that way out? Well, the provision is available, but we would, we're, we'll be coming back to you next year um, with a very a specific proposal about how we could, as a state, make a universal meals option available to any school in Vermont. So it's not, it will cost some money. If this legislation passes, it's not currently available to those schools that are receiving those right. meals based but on we, today's criteria. That's correct. But um, because this is a gradual rollout of increasing the minimum wage, um, we do believe we have some time to work on, on those things. It would be a, a big concern for me because um, the majority of the schools in my district receive. Yes, universal and, and I meals. appreciate that you're thinking Thank you. that way. Thank, Thank you. you. And, uh, and John, I'm going to actually interrupt here. Um, I, I, would, I do want to stop. I want, I would like to invite you back, not only to talk about this in, in the moment, but also about the strides that we've made. I think that while we focus on what we're not doing, I think I, I do want to focus on what Hunger, Hunger Free Vermont has done over the last 15 plus years um, to get us to the point where we are. Because um, I think it's pretty, it's, it's been life changing for some communities. Um, and, and the way that it's been ruled out is, you, I mean, those, those of us in communities where, that, where we've seen the benefits whether it's in summer programs or not, 
or, or in longer, longer term programs. I'm just, I, I personally would like to hear more about what's going on across the state. Um, but again, I, I appreciate you coming in and letting us interrupt you. Um, we just have this other little inconsequential bill that we're just trying to get across <laughs> yeah. the, the, the line today. Uh, so. so we support that bill too, and I'm very happy to see that <laughs> for you to do work on it. And my full testimony is available and the contact information is there. So if anybody would like additional data, if there's any way that I can provide additional information to the committee, you're just welcome to reach out to me. And thank you so much for the opportunity and for your time today and for your very hard work in this legislative session. Thanks. We'll see you soon. All right, committee, I don't want to take five minutes. Um, so, folks who have come for minimum wage, Pizza. thank you. I to make change. We are going to hear from Zach. I'd like to just take three take three minutes to stretch legs and be back here at 10 of so that we can start so right on time. Here with us, up oh, with Representative that? Ralph. Oh. Uh, no, Representative Ralph, you start. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just hang out. We are just going to hear uh, Representative Ralph's simple little amendment to our bill. Yes. Okay. <laughs> simple little amendment. Yeah. We laugh at everybody that says that in our committee. Um, yeah. For the record, I'm Zachariah Ralph. I'm the representative for Heartland, Windsor, and West Windsor. And I'm here today to present an amendment to uh, H107, the Paid Family Leave Bill. Um, and it's actually to revert it back to uh, the way the bill was when it came out of uh, House uh, Government Operations uh, left, the first time you got sent out. So uh, well, yeah, currently, General, King, General, General Housing. General Housing, excuse me. <laughs> Where am I right now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, as it is right now, the bill uh, puts 100% of the cost for paid family leave on the employees. The amendment would shift it back where it's shared 50% between the employees and the employers. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys want me to go into reasoning for why I'm presenting this, or if uh, uh, we have some time, if okay. you want to go into it. And, and just to be clear, the current amendment is the, the current version of the bill. A lot is not 100% on the employee. It's possibly 100 percent on either the employer or the employee or some split thereof. That's correct. Okay. There is the option for the employer to offer this. What I've heard um, is that it's a potential incentive to get employees to come and work for them. Um, sure. Not sure I totally agree with that logic. But um, so the reason I'm presenting this is, um, first of all, I want to appreciate um, thank the Government Operations Committee for all your guys' hard work. I know you work on a lot of issues. General yeah. housing. Yeah. Thank you. Again, there I am. I defer to. Um, so uh, I appreciate the work you all do. And um, thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time to give sure. sure. So um, really this is a question of uh, why are we doing this bill? And I think we've heard lots of testimony about why pay, paid family leave is so, is so important. Um, women make up a large part of our workforce, and it is inevitable that some women <coughs> will have babies. Uh, this is an essential part of the continuation of life on this earth. And the first three months of a child's life are extremely formational. Uh, the time that a, a mother, a father, or a family spends with this child um, can determine the rest of that child's life. Um, and so the, that's why those, the need for family leave is so important. So we're creating that time for families to spend with their newborns. Um, but the problem is that since we do not have mandatory family leave, uh, families are forced into a situation where they either have to go back to their um, go back to work earlier than they like, um, or they lose their jobs, um, or they are doing this hodgepodge of figuring out how to combine um, all their benefits into enough time to spend with their child. And this is, of course, during one of the probably what I imagine is one of the most stressful and complicated periods of any family's life, which is bringing a child into this world. And so we are trying to address this problem by offering paid family leave to these families so they don't have to deal with this burden. Now, um, the bill as it is, and why I'd like to amend it, is because I do not believe the bill is addressing this issue. I believe that this um, will look great in the headlines, that the House passed family leave. But ultimately, all it does is shift 
where the, where the funding is coming from, but not who's paying from it. Unless, of course, all the employees, uh, employers decide, or a bunch of employees decide to offer this as an incentive for their um, employees to join. And by the way, I just received um, an email from one of my small businesses in my area that was adamantly opposed to family leave because of the additional burden it would put on uh, employers. So I'm not optimistic employers will be offering this. Um, and it's certainly not the big ones who are not as connected um, to the actual employees themselves. So much of the cost still would remain with the families. And, um, and as it is, we don't pay a livable wage. Uh, we don't pay enough for people to be able to afford food, health care, housing. And as a result, who pays for this additional cost, which every Vermonter will pay for? And the answer is us. It's the state. Um, because when we're not providing, when the employer is not providing these things, and we're just taking it out of their paycheck, it means that these people that are already overburdened will need food assistance, fuel assistance, and assistance on their health care, which means that we will be taxing more. And I don't think anybody in this room wants to tax anybody more. Um, and so this essentially is another example of businesses externalizing internal costs. Um, since it is an, uh, an integral part of life to have children, this should be considered an essential service and that our employers should recognize that if they would like to employ women and employ families that plan to have children, that they also need to be providing the funds necessary to allow for them to take care of those children in those formidable years. So um, for those reasons and many, many more, I have offered this amendment. And I, um, in full disclosure, I have been told to present this bill and withdraw it on the floor immediately um, to make my point. I'm not trying to make a point. I think it's important this is what we do. I think the people in the state would like to see an actual paid family leave. And so very much at this point, it comes down to the committee and whether you're willing to accept this amendment and change the language and, and hopefully get some support on the floor so we can actually create something that's meaningful. So um, with that, I, I ask for the committee's support in, uh, in, in this amendment. And happy to take questions, of course. Um, well, let's hear from, um, do we have a couple of quick questions? I just, One. Yep. Yeah. All right. I'm just curious. Have you ever owned a business? Uh, uh, no, no, I have not. No. Thank you. I think it's um, it's really important. I know that our businesses struggle, uh, without a doubt. I have uh, communicated with our businesses quite often in Heartland, in West Windsor, and Windsor, on a regular basis. I think that they have a strong voice in our state house. Um, we hear from the chamber all the time, and all the business advocates. We don't hear from regular residents a lot. But and you've I, never owned or run a business? Um, no, I have not. But I run a household, and, uh, and that's, um, that's what we're dealing with as individuals. So at this point, it's, it's important for me that we are taking care of our families and individuals in the state, putting that need over the needs of profits from our businesses. Because ultimately, those people will determine our future. The people and the children that we raise will determine what services we're paying for. If we continue the way we're going, we will continue to see suicides, opioid, depression, and addiction at a level that will increase. And who pays for that but us and the businesses as well? It is not the cost of living in the state that makes it so businesses don't stay here. It's the fact that we have a drug problem. So would I be correct in assuming that you believe every business could afford to do this for their employees? I think that um, we live in a capitalist society. And uh, that we need to, that it is up to the free market system to determine whether those businesses exist or not, and not up to us <coughs> to subsidize them or make it easier for them but to But we exist. are doing that. That's exactly what we're doing, yes. <coughs> and almost every other aspect. Okay. Damien? Yep. So, um, for the record, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council. Uh, so, what this uh, amendment does is it takes the current language um, in the, the Ways and Means uh, Strike All Amendment of what passed out of this committee, and uh, what it does is it, the wrong section of the bill, um, what it does is it strikes out the language that provides uh, that, uh, let's see, an employer shall have the option of paying some or all of the contributions due for an employee's covered wages or may deduct and withhold the full amount of the contribution due from the employee's covered wages 
and replaces it with the language that uh, was voted out in the old version of this bill that passed this committee. Um, so this is uh, almost identical to what passed this committee, just tweaked a little bit to fit the current structure of the bill. So that's it. Uh, Representative Byron, the trial. So the cost structure currently is 0.55 to the employee with the option for the pay in to come from the employer. That's still about roughly half of what the original bill was at 0 0.97. 0 0.93. 0 0.93, sorry. So, I mean, fundamentally it's almost the, the same required buy in from the employee from what the bill was that we passed out of our committee. So the, the original one would have been, yeah, about a tenth of a percentage point lower, yeah. um, but the benefits have changed a little bit. The, the benefits have changed. Have changed yeah, so it's, wage it's replacements like, dropped and, yeah. and leave length as well. No, I got all that, but like fundamentally yeah. the, the, the cost is almost the same to the employee as what we passed out. Yeah, the cost is a, a tenth of a percentage point higher, assuming the employer doesn't cover any of it. Correct, assuming that they don't assist. Yeah. John? I'm sorry, Chip and then John. Um, how will this uh, impact the uh, startup 0.1% um, uh, and, and graduating to, uh, will that have any impact at all on that startup uh, six months? That I mean, it's, it's not going to impact the amount of revenue that's generated by the startup six months. Uh, all it will do is it will set a mandatory minimal split of 50-50, so then right. you'll basically employees will be paying 0.05% and employers will be paying 0.05% during that startup six months. Right, okay, and so that does that, change, yeah. 0.275, 0.275. Uh, minimum from employers after that and then maximum of 0.275 from employees after, 50, after uh, that. 50-50, right. That's okay. right. Thank you. Um, and the original version that we all passed it was 50-50 split, which I think is, uh, is, is quite fair. Uh, but I just want to make sure, are you going to, you're going to present this, but then you're going to withdraw it? Or you were asked to withdraw it, you're planning not to withdraw it? I've been asked to withdraw it several times. Okay. I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. Okay. <laughs> um. I'd like to know how the committee would, would feel about it before I make any decisions. Well, I, I'm conflicted because I, I, I actually like this very much, the 50 50 split. But as it's, it's moved through the process, it's changed into this. Now it's optional, and we don't know what this is. Um, but I, I, I do like to, to share it. With them. But I guess if you're going to withdraw it, then I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's kind of like, so I'm confused. That's why I've been asking you to get rid of the parts. Can I just ask a question that you just said it's optional. What's optional? I don't see anything in this that's optional. Who pays what share? Right now. Oh, right now it's optional. That's, with this amendment, it would put it back to 50. It would be, it would be shared yeah, in this, equally yeah. shared. Good to hear. I just didn't know what you were referring to was optional because I didn't really see much about the bill that was optional. Who pays? Yeah. Who pays the insurance premium. Okay, any further questions on this? Do we want to hear, do we want to vote on this now or do we um, want to hear Representative Brown's amendment? Let's vote on this now, I think is the best way to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mary, are you just about ready to go? Uh, yes. All right, you both. Yeah, and, and thank you for bringing us back our own language. Um, you know, obviously, as, as Representative Kalaki um, mentioned, you know, this, 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 this did pass through here at a strong vote. Um, but I do think that the, the notions that were presented as bills evolved in the other committees um, tend to be uh, tend to be something that we were you know that we're 
that, that we, we would be following. Um, I appreciate that represent Stevens and, and uh, imitation is the highest compliment in my opinion. So uh, yeah. well, you know, back with your own bill. Those of us on government operations yeah. are very excited. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting punchy. Um, He's still got a floor report for me. I know, I know. Um, that's why they call it a punditocracy. Um, so um, I would take um, a motion to view this amendment as unfavorable, which would mean a yes vote to make it unfavorable and a no vote to find it favorable. Does that make sense or is that too complicated? Yeah, that's complicated. <laughs> Why would you not just want the amendment, the, the motion to be favorable? Well, there's a political exists. semantic in there. Yes, which I. But do. if you would like yeah. to make a motion to find it favorable, I'm not making any motion. <laughs> we do have to have a motion in a second. We do have to. We do have to vote on this bill. So I need a motion in a second. And what's your pleasure? And we'll sort it out after that. I move we find the amendment unfavorable. So that means a yes vote means you're not in favor of the amendment. Correct. Clear. So just be clear. <laughs> okay, Mary, are you yes, clear on that? No. Yes. <laughs> okay, any further conversation on Representative? Should we go second? Uh, yeah. Representative yeah. Byron. Okay. okay. Sorry, our second man. <laughs> okay, any further conversation on this amendment? Uh, hearing none, clerk can commence to call it the roll. Representative Walls. Yes. Representative Long? Yes. Representative Gamash? Yes. Representative Troiano? No. Representative <coughs> Howard votes no. Representative Kalaki? No. Representative Sot? What did you vote? Did you vote yes or no? Me? Yeah, I didn't hear what you oh, said. Oh, I'm sorry, no. You said you voted no. Yes. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Stevens? Yes. Representative Pango? Yes. So that's seven, four, unfavorable, or no, seven, seven, three, three. Seven, seven, three, three one. one. Thank you all very much for your time. I do appreciate it. And uh, uh, thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming in, Thank Zach. You. I appreciate it. Of course. You all. No. your comment on, uh, on you know uh, the other work that other committees have done and I, you know and I think that's part of the consideration of this I had to really think about this this particular one and, and you know particularly how to word the amendment so I think you know we really have to pay attention to uh, the work other committees have done and especially when you're listening to the money committees and so that really colored my view on this I also think this, what we just did, will make it more palatable to more people. So, because it will help small business. So let me be perfectly clear: a yes vote was not to use that amendment. Right. Correct. Correct. Thanks. It, under the category <coughs> yes, we have no bananas. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, exactly. yes, we have. Okay. Correct. <coughs> <laughs> Was that how you voted? Mm -hmm. Okay.
So is anyone able to um, review Representative Browning's amendment before it now? It's 21 pages of it? It is long. I gave it a once over. No, well, ours was <laughs> like 20 some odd pages long. Okay. Um, really um, after yesterday, it's 16 pages yeah, long. I think there was only one small change, but I Yeah, I'm not really sure what is different. Uh, what's different is the f uh, number one is the size of benefit. Okay, it's limited changes to that. four weeks for anything and everything. Okay. Um, I believe the split. I believe the 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 benefit split is this is ninety fifties. That's the same thing. Um, employees. I, I'm not sure what the employer option is on it, but the employees can <coughs> opt out. Employees are allowed to opt out. Yep. Uh, and the effective dates are important to pay attention to because the effective date is delayed until after a study comes back. Um, so that, and Representative Browning can talk more about that, but there's a, a study uh, in there that's. That's, that's, the timing is really important. What the <laughs> <laughs> Representative Brown, welcome. Representative Stevens, thank you. Do you have an amendment for us on H107, yes, and it is up on the screen behind thank you. you. Thank you. Um, what I like to do is uh, characterize, characterize the amendment overall and some of the key changes rather than go through the amendment piece by piece. Because um, you can do that, you can read through the amendment later, and I just want to give you the, the overview. Okay, the key things about this amendment are that it changes the paid family leaves, medical leaves for the different qualifying situations to four weeks for all of them. So parental bonding, your own illness or injury, and caring for a family member are all four weeks. And another key thing is that it provides for an individual employee opt-out. So the situation is that everybody who's working 20 hours or more is automatically enrolled unless you fill out a form that tells you about the program, but you opt out. So it's not an opt-in voluntary, it's everybody's enrolled unless you explicitly opt out. So those are the two key characteristics of it, and I'll talk more about the other changes. But they're motivated by my concern that the benefits program in the underlying bill of seven is um, generous enough and it's new enough that I'm concerned about financial sustainability. I think we've learned with other benefit systems, the pension systems and other kinds of things like that, that once you put in place a benefit structure, it's very hard to ever reduce it because people really resist that and rightfully so. So I think it's really important to start a benefit at a small level and then depending on how it goes, you can always increase it. But if you start at a higher level, you're never going to, I mean, you certainly could theoretically reduce it, but we don't do that very often. Um, and understand, again, that's very understandable. So I'm very concerned. I think this is such an important area. We need to do this in the right way. We need to do this in a careful way. So I want to start small and then grow it. Now with the opt-out issue, I think that people should be in this program and I hope they will stay in this program. But I also feel that the underlying bill provides flexibilities for employers because they can decide whether they want to pay some of the premium or not, some of the contribution or not. It provides flexibility if you have an employer that gives you better benefits of this, you can stay with that. Or if you have a union contract, your benefits are better, you can go to that. But it doesn't give an individual worker any flexibility. They have to be in this program and they have to pay that contribution. And I know that there are Vermonters who would prefer not to pay for this and they don't want the benefit. So, and in fact, we know that because you're making the program mandatory because we know that some people would opt out. So I want to give people, people who want to keep an extra $150 or $250 or $450 in their paycheck instead of this, either they don't think they're going to have those qualifying events or they have it covered in a different way, that they should have the right to opt out. Again, you're required to enroll, and you will be in enrolled automatically unless you explicitly opt out. But I want people to have that choice. So, um, so that's the overall structure of, of the changes I made. I'll talk about a couple of other changes, but I also need to say that this is a much shorter bill, much shorter amendment than the underlying bill, because since I'm going with the opt-out structure, 
um, we have to evaluate what effect that might have on the rate of contribution because you have adverse selection that people who, um, you'll end up with a pool that has more people who are going to use it than if you had the entire universe in the pool. So I worked with Joyce Manchester about trying to come up with a range of possible rates, but I was not able to order a run to analyze my version of the program the way Ways and Means did for other versions because I'm just me, I'm not Ways and Means. So, so this proposal is a preliminary proposal, and what it asks is for the administration to evaluate this approach and answer some of these questions, do that modeling, and then come back to the General Assembly with a report next January. And then, depending on how we evaluate it at that time, we would make a commitment. So it's shorter because I don't have to have all the rulemaking and the other things that has to be set up when you're saying, we're doing this. So that's why it's so much shorter. And all the questions about what, what about self-employed, what about the rules, that's all in the report, which is one of the last sections of the bill that I asked for. So that's why it's a shorter bill, and that's a big difference in this. And I know that's a disappointment because I know people want to move forward, but with something like this that is so important, it's really important that we do it right and that we do it cautiously. And I think it's worth exploring this alternative approach. Um, just for some tentative numbers, based on um, a sort of an extrapolation or interpolation from the modeling done on the other version, the version that's in 107, JFO has estimated that this version, because of the shorter number of weeks, I keep the same benefit levels, the same benefit levels as in uh, the 90% up to a certain level and then 50% thereafter. That's the same, but it's just four weeks. Because of that, the cost, including administration, drops from about 80 million to 46 million. Now, the rate of contribution might be as low as 0.3, or it might be as low as 0.5, depending on the adverse selection process. And we use factors provided by insurance companies to come up with those calculations. I think it would probably be about in the middle, because I think about 70 or 70. Most of the surveys that we do say that 70 or percent of people want this and will pay for it. So if that held true, you'd probably be at about 0.4. So um, it costs more and you're getting less, but you have the opt-out, and that's really, and, it, and the whole thing costs less. So that's why I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at here. I also have other things like that you um, have to take, you have, you take it in one week chunks, so that if you need to take a day here or a day there, you have to go to chemo, or you have to take care of your mother after surgery, you use your other kinds of leave for that. It's, this is for things that are going to be weeks long, that becomes you know, one week chunk. And I did that in order to reduce the amount of churn that um, the insurance company has in terms of taking the applications and paying out the claims. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's really the outline of the amendment, and, and it, it, it sets a, a, a shorter number of weeks. It, may, it provides for an opt-out once a year. Um, in December, when you do all your benefits, you'd have the opportunity to disenroll. Um, and, uh, and it asks for a report back before we proceed with this approach. Doesn't it, I, the, the version I saw, I think, in the calendar, doesn't it also have a week where you, a week off? Yes. First, you have to be out, you have to essentially be not working for a week before you can apply for the leave. And, um, and that was, again, to try to deal with the question of churn and what is this really for. And, and you know, the studies have shown that when people really need this leave, they take it, whether they have paid leave or even unpaid leave, because the need is so overwhelming. The question is, when is that need? And, and my idea is that, um, is that you, it has to be severe enough so that you're out of work a week and then you trigger the paid family leave. So does that week end up being part of a unpaid leave through FMLA, it or would, is that? It would depend on how the employer and the employee wanted to handle it. They could take unpaid leave from FMLA, <coughs> or they could be taking, um, they could be taking, uh, using up vacation days or paid sick days, personal leave days that they might have accumulated with their employer. So again, so this would be a two, but that would. Is that just the first time you use it, or is that for each time you use it? So does that have to mean that you do a two weeks, a two week leave essentially each time? Um, I did not develop an answer to those kinds of detailed questions because, again, I think there are things that would have to be studied and characterized in order to deal with this 
slightly different version of the program. Um, my intent is not to reduce people's leaves opportunity. It's my intent is to reduce the administrative cost of the program, which would reduce the overall cost, which would benefit everybody. So if it was a question of you had the one week leave the first time you ever took it and then you never had that again, that would be one way to go. I think that makes sense. Um, or another way would be every time you took it, you have to have the week. But I did not clarify that because I can't answer that question. Uh -huh. But I think that's one of the unanswered questions that would have to be in what because I don't even know enough. I mean, just from the brief amount of evaluation <laughs> from insurance companies, I don't know enough about exactly what are the key parts of their administrative burdens. And I do know they talked about churn and you know dealing with some of lots and lots of applications. And so. Uh, I was trying to say you have to take it in chunks, in partly to reduce that burden, and it may not be worth it. But that's what that's what I, you know that's what. Okay. John, um, in the bill as it now stands, not yes. your amendment, it's yes, a maximum of twelve weeks. Yes. And with four your weeks. four weeks, four weeks of everything. Everything, yes. So for medical leave yes. or four, four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks total. Total from from so I could have a week for for caring for my mother, a week for myself, two weeks for my new adopted child, and annually that would be what I have. And it's definitely less, but the key point is to start and prove that the program is viable and affordable, and then you can expand it later. So I'm not denying that everybody would like to be more generous. I'm just concerned about using up $80 million of taxing capacity. I know we're calling this a contribution, but it walks like a tax. It talks like a tax and it's a payroll tax. You're using up $80 million of taxing capacity. It's not going to be there if you want to do universal primary care. It's not going to be there if you want to do single payer. It's not going to be there for other <coughs> because you're using it up. You are more than reversing the income tax rate reductions of last year for people who have income that's only wages. Because we went from 3.55 for the lowest bracket to 3.35. We're adding 5.55 to that, so we're going back up to 390. So you are essentially increasing a payroll tax or an income tax. You're not going to be able to go back and increase those rates for other purposes. But you just used it here. So I would like to use less of the taxing capacity, start smaller, include the individual opt-out, and then it can always evolve as we go forward. Just the second thing. Yeah. You said the study has to determine what it would be, but you expect that it will be more costly. And the bill as it currently stands. Um, it, it won't be. It won't be more costly. The current bill is 0.55 percent. The range that um, JFO and I did, and this is very rough. Yeah. We just worked with what we had was between 0.33 and 0.48. So all of those are less than this. Okay. But you have less leave. I and I was just trying to say that, that that based on the idea that about 70, 75 percent of people would stay in. Um, would not opt out, then it would be about 0.4, okay. which is less. Um, so, so you are paying less, but you are getting less, and I acknowledge that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right, Damien, do you need to walk through this, or is it Representative Browning did a good job of summarizing the bill? I'm happy to answer specific questions, but a lot of what's in this bill. <laughs> is a, a repeat um, from the underlying bill, and she highlighted the key differences, which are the employee opt-out, the shorter leave period, um, and then the delay on the effective date until after the results of the study come back. Mm -hmm. And then the study asks for a lot of looking at this and recommendations on um, recommendations on additional legislation that might be necessary and rules and so forth. Uh, and it's done in such a way so that the results come back so there's a full session for the legislature to, to put those pieces into place or to push the program out if there's more lead time needed. Um, yeah, so it, but essentially pushes the whole calendar out, the timeline out a year, yeah. or approximately a year. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just smiling because because that's where that's our that was the timeline of our bill when it came out, and just the way the bills evolved yes. is, is just it's fascinating. It's oh, fascinating. See, there's a lot of irony in these two conversations. <laughs> that we around today. Um, yeah. Representative Triano. So let me make sure I have this straight. Um, 
leave is taken one week at a time. So if you're diagnosed with brain cancer and you are in the process of trying to get into chemotherapy and go on a regular basis to chemotherapy and um, feel terrible as a result of it, that you've got to go back to work in a week no, after that happens? No, you don't. You can use other That's what I'm trying to ask. You can use, if it's, if, it's, if it's a question of I need treatment this day and I need two days to recover, which is less than a week, so that would be three days, you would use your um, accumulated leaves from other sources, or if you had already used a Zala, you would use unpaid paid leave. Or you would stay out more than a week and then you would be eligible for this. So this is about okay. something that is serious and is going to take up a week, a week of your time, more than a week of your time. It's not for taking a day off here or there I because of the part. question of term. And that is something that you know can be studied and evaluated. But I was really trying to deal with the question that we saw in the insurance company documents about um, the concern about churn and about how that 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 having they actually recommended taking longer chunks of leave to reduce the administrative cost because you don't want the administrative cost eating up too much of the revenue because then it's not going to the benefits. So that was one reason I put it in there. But it would be subject to evaluation. So those are those are basically you're considering the weekly <coughs> units. I mean, yes. Especially. Yes. Um, yes. So I have a question specifically about that. It sounds to me as if you're assuming then instead of adopting this businesses adopting this and replacing what they have businesses would have two because you're saying they're going to have other systems of allowing leave and then this. Well, we've already required businesses to, to, to offer, what is it, five days of paid personal leave. So you have you have that already. People have vacation leave. So they accumulate a, a number of just different sources of leave. I'm not require, requiring business to offer this. This is up to individuals to, to have it in which case the businesses have to collect the premium and send it in, or individuals can opt out. But this can be used sequentially because it's less than the 12 weeks that, 12 weeks is where you have the um, job protection, you lose job protection after 12 weeks of unpaid leave and after 12 weeks of paid leave in 107. Since mine is only four weeks, if you work for a business that provided two weeks family leave, you could now add this sequentially on, so you'd end up with six weeks because you have two different sources. So I'm seeing this as something that could be used in addition to something that somebody already has. It's not a replacement. In 107, if you have better benefits, then you can keep better benefits and you don't do this. You know, and, and, and that could happen with mine, because, but you always have to look at where you have, how, when you run out of job protection. But this is supposed to be very flexible for the workers and for the businesses in terms of um, you know, they can keep offering what they're already offering, and then if some of their workers want this too, they get it. Okay, so it sounds. Um, yeah, okay. So, so probably we're going to be businesses that continue to do as well. Absolutely. And, and then add this expense. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But 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 as I've drafted this, it's up to the employees to say, I want this, I want more. Um, I, the businesses are not playing that decision role. I think that's one factor that you put in the report as to whether a business could sort of opt in and pay the premiums for all the workers and then everybody's in and they wouldn't have an opt out. You know, so there's some things that I just, it got complicated. Oh, I'm sorry, I just have to step out. Yes, I want right. to thank you for coming in oh, and sure. talking about this. Not a problem. Chip will take over for you. No, thank you for Not a problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Lisa, I'm sorry. So could you expand a little bit more on what Representative Walsh was just asking about and, and clearly state what the obligation for an employer is under your proposed amendment? OK, I may phone a friend, but I will say that, um, <laughs> that, that my understanding is that the obligation of the employer is when they're going over all the paperwork, when you hire someone, you know, your W-2 and your deductions or whatever, they would have a sheet of paper that would describe this program and there would be an opt-out box. <coughs> and if somebody opts out, the employer does not withhold and send in those premiums. If they stay in, then they withhold and send in those premiums. So the employer's obligation would be to do what their worker tells them in terms of collecting and remitting the premium to the tax department. And they, um, they have no other obligation or role that I can see. No financial obligation. No financial obligation. Is that yeah, that's correct. So the contributions, they keep the same um, language as passed out of House Ways and Means, which is the 
it's the employer's option if they're going to pay any portion of the contributions. Uh, so they get to decide whether they're going to pay any portion, whatever that is, or whether the employee is going to cover the contributions. And then the employees get to decide if they would rather opt out and not pay the contributions and not participate in the program. And it's kind of treated the same way as uh, enrollment and other benefits programs are at work. So there's an annual enrollment or disenrollment period. And then uh, there are, the language is put in there so it protects against people bouncing in and out of the program to take advantage of it. Um, you have to, if you opt out, you have, when you opt in, you have to start over again for meeting your eligibility requirements and so forth. So, um, but it's, it's set up that your business is uh, just like in the, the underlying amendment um, from Ways and Means, businesses don't have an obligation to pay any contributions. They do have the obligation to, to handle the withholding, uh, but the, they can elect to pay a portion or all of it, but it's really up to them. The employees here are given the additional option of saying, I also don't want to pay the contributions because I'd rather not participate in this program. That's, that's what this bill does that's different from the House Ways and Means approach, um, or that's, that's probably the biggest difference. I mean, there's the change in the benefit link, and then things are pushed out to study the issue more, but that, that's kind of the key. The key piece there is the employee choice as well. Okay, thank you. Do you mind if I just no, one go, more, go, go. more follow-up? <laughs> Sorry, because I was not here for the initial bill, and I'm still trying to understand that. If the Ways and Means Amendment doesn't pass, how does this, how does your amendment that you're offering reflect back to the original bill? Okay, my amendment is a strike all amendment. So if um, if one or the other succession, successive amendments, whether it's ways or means or probes or whatever, did not pass, um, my amendment is a strike all, so it just sets up what I say. Okay. But I'm not quite sure in terms of how things are handled on the floor. Sometimes I think you introduce all the amendments and then you start voting on them, so, so that's about my pay grade. So <coughs> but this is a standalone. Uh, you don't have to worry about would this We're piece of House General yes. stay in there uh, or this piece of the appropriations report stay in there if you have a concern about one of those or is it is her amendment not going to work anymore if something happens with the reports it'll it'll stand alone on its by itself. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah. that that's, no, yeah. no, that's good that you left. Uh, Representative Hango, are you all set? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Marshall. So I just want to reaffirm. So the way the bill stands <coughs> now, the employer has the ability to completely opt out. In the existing bill. In the existing they don't bill. have to pay any. No, no, right. Yeah. And, then, and then the employee would have the responsibility to pay the full amount of whatever it would be. Yes. <coughs> With your amendment now, if, if the employer were to opt out and say, no, I don't want to pay anything, and it's up to the employee, your bill says, your amendment says, if the employee wants to participate, otherwise the employee can opt out. Yes, and right. the default is that you're in. Okay. I mean, right. you, you, I, you are going to be enrolled unless you fill out a form okay. and say, no, I'm not going to be enrolled, and it gets sent to the tax department, and then the withholding doesn't happen. So the default is that you're enrolled. So it's not the default you're not enrolled and you have to take action. No, no, the default is you're enrolled. But but the key thing is I'm concerned about um, workers who do not feel they need this and they're going to be paying 150, 350, 500 dollars out of their paychecks for something that they don't want. And and that's what I'm trying to provide flexibility with for both the workers and the businesses. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Representative Thank Browning. You. Thank Thanks you. for coming in and sharing this with us. Sure. Anything further from you, Damien? Thanks, Damien. Damien? Damien, anything uh, to add? Um, the, I think the only thing that um, I forgot to mention was just that the, the employees here, you have to have, um, to be considered an employee, you have to be working 20 hours a week. Um, so that was uh, that's another big change from the underlying. Oh, so okay. it's an individual who's 
performing, working 20 hours a week or more for an employer. Um, so folks who are, in order to be considered an employee for this, and then to be an enrolled employee, you have to have chosen not to opt out. So once you, if you're in that half time or more position, you have the option of opting out. If you choose not to opt out, then it's just a question of meeting her definition of uh, what we what I call a qualified employee, and that's uh, someone who's earned wages on contributions in the last 12 months over the last two years, uh, or earned wages that are subject to contributions. So basically, you've been enrolled uh, in the program, and you've earned wages. Uh, for 12 months where you've been enrolled and you've been paying contributions and then you can use your leave. But in order to get to that point of being able to enroll, you have to have worked 20 hours? You have to, yeah, you have to be employed for 20 hours a week. So it's not, okay. you don't have to work 20 hours first, but you have to be actually working 20 hours a week. Or more. So, yeah. For what period of time? Uh, it just says working for an it. average of 20 hours a week. So, I haven't specified the time. Again, okay. this is part of the part of the reason why the study is put in this bill is because this is a big concept change. Right. We have a very short period of time to think about it, and so that's why uh, her model is to take the kind of the big uh, sort of um, framing for the concept. Right. And then we're going to fill in and hang the drywall for the insulation and the wiring. After the stir. <laughs> to, to use the, the house analogy, that, that study, what the, the design of the study is to get the administration, so the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, working with commissioners of labor and tax, private insurance carriers, and third party administrators, is going to report. Uh, do a report that analyzes and assesses the feasibility of creating this program and then looks at specific issues around uh, adequate contribution rates, establishment of a public-private partnership and what that would look like. Um, so, and whether that, what degree that public-private partnership might shift administration to a third party uh, to a private insurance carrier, to a third party administrator, uh, to how to ensure adequate appeals within this framework uh, where you're dealing with private insurance carrier, but it's a state program, how to make the program enrollment as efficient as possible, et cetera. So they're really looking to allow time for the administration to work with the private insurance carriers and third party administrators to do some deep program design and then come back next January 15th with the additional pieces that need to be put into law and the rules that they will need to adopt and this report for the legislature to say, okay, you've thought this through, and then that there's a year still before the effective date to allow those changes to happen with the legislation. So that's, that's I think, kind of the key piece. So if there are some little pieces here that are missing, that's intentional because they're questions that uh, because this is coming in as an amendment. Right. Because it's a framework. Um, it's a framework, yeah. not okay. not the final product. We're the walls. Uh, so the 20 weeks, okay, so that hit me thinking, what about the, uh, the piece about the, uh, the four quarters and dividing by 26, yeah. is that gone from the amendment too? Or? So I left, um, I left a lot of the other definitions in there um, for purposes of this. So you're, when you're determining an average weekly wage, you still look at the two highest earning quarters out of the last four. Okay. Um, when you're uh, looking at um, definition of employer has stayed the same, uh, the definition of family member has stayed the same. So a lot of the things have stayed the same but it's these key pieces that are changing a little bit. So employees have changed and we have this opt-out piece. So we've added a definition of what's an enrolled employee. It's someone who's chosen not to opt out. Um, and then, so that, those, those are kind of the big changes. And then a lot of the nitty gritty details that are in the current 
bill um, have been pulled out. So the appeals section is pulled out because we're asking them to study that and come back with a structure that they think is going to be workable and efficient with this framework. Um, the uh, penalty and enforcement piece is pulled out because we're asking them to come back with a structure on this. So we've kept the tax collection piece. Um, we've kept the benefits piece, kind of some of the really big pieces, but then some of the, the more um, getting down to the nitty gritty details of how is this functioning on a day to day basis have been pulled out so that they can be studied and designed through that process. Is the portion still in there where if a, an insurance company isn't found that can administer this, or in four years the state decides they want to take this over, then um, so the, then, is that still in there? The study about the state taking it over is pulled out, okay. uh, and the RFP process has been pulled out for now, uh, again because they, she wanted to have the study in place mm -hmm. before we dictate what the timeline and the requirements for the RFP are through okay. legislation. So that that's again one of those pieces where she felt it was important to get the feedback from the study, which is looking at to what extent do we want to use a third party insurance carrier or third party administrators so that you know what to do the RFP for because conceivably you could do an RFP for a third party to step in the place of the state for everything. Or you could say we want to have an insurance carrier that administers benefits and the funds, and then we want to have a third party administrator that administers another aspect of the program because we want to separate those out. Um, and there are examples of other states having done that with, no state has done this with family leave, but the example in my world that I would think of is Maine when they privatized their liquor control. Uh, they separated marketing from the actual management of distribution and so forth. Although ultimately, the two branches of the same company submitted the winning bids for those those things. But they set it up so that conceivably they could have a separate marketing company come in with the expertise there, and then a logistics. Uh, focused company come in to do the distribution and the warehousing and so forth, and they felt that those were different enough that they wanted to focus that expertise. So that's something this leaves flexibility for. Representative Clark. Well, I, I'm totally opposed to this amendment. I, I think it benefited uh, <coughs> the process well before all of us came into this room about looking at this, the issues around this, and I think our committee went through a kind of deep dive into this and uh, as it moved move forward to the other committees. This changes the structure and then says, let everything else will be figured out. And I, so it's half-baked. So I, I, I propose that we vote on unfavorable for this and move on. Yes, we are going to vote this out. And if you would like to form, make that in the form of a motion, yes. uh, Representative Kalaki. OK, do we have a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Representative Walsh. Yes, I'm also going to, well, I don't know how you phrase that, to find it unfavorable? Yes. So it's like the last vote, a yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> OK, I want to make sure which way I'm okay, talking. So yes. everyone's clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying yes. I'm right. saying correct or incorrect. <laughs> right. So I, I want to share why, well, there are lots of things about this I don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like the idea that you have to take the leave of one week chunks that does not reflect the realities of being ill. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't like the idea that you have to take a week and find another way to pay for it before the benefits. You can even apply for the benefits. And four weeks for bonding, nah. Not even close to being long enough. Doesn't get you into daycare territory. No, no. So I, I really, I think there's some major failings here. And then the basically, the other major thing I don't like Representative Kalaki, Kalaki already addressed, sorry, <laughs> Kalaki already addressed is, there's just not enough meat on the bones here, to use another uh, analogy. Uh, we're going to do this, and then we're going to study it. Well, uh, no. Uh, Half-baked? Yeah. 
not even in the oven, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm totally opposed to this. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, will the clerk um, call the roll? Representative Wallace. Okay, double checking. Yes, okay, let's okay. do that. Yes means I'm not in favor of the amendment. Correct. Correct. You're finding it unfavorable with the yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Right. Make sure. <laughs> Representative Law? Yes. Representative Gamash? No. Uh, Representative Triano? Uh, yes. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki? Yes. Representative Saad? Yes. Representative Byron? Yes. And Representative Stevens will. And so uh, Representative Stevens has asked oh, to. Wait, 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 I'm done. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. You started I'm jumping in. Sorry. 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 I've got to get all those votes. Okay. Sorry. Representative sorry. Stevens will be here. back to vote. <laughs> Representative Hangel. No. So the vote is still open. The vote is still open. And the vote remains yes. open, yes. Thank you. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, That's it. Anything else for me, Mr. Chair? I don't believe so. All right. Thank you, Damien. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks very much for your help.